All right. Is this working? There we go. So good morning again. I, I'm just, I'm too jittery. This is gonna be weird. Now I can't move. You can't move. This is gonna be so weird. I don't know if I can do this. All right. Um, does anyone have something I can play with? <laughs> um, good morning. Hope you're having a, uh, a good weekend so far. Um, if you are, I mean, the good news is it's a long weekend and you get another day of it. If you're not, um, I guess the good news is you got a day to fix it. Um, I know some of your families, though, so good luck. But um, <laughs> uh, this morning... I want to talk about something that I'm thankful for. Um, a little preaching hack is to do a sermon for Thanksgiving. Take something you're working on, call it something you're thankful for. So that's what we're doing this morning. Um, we're, we're going to use actually my favorite verse in the Bible, and we're also going to use my favorite story in the Bible to do this. Um, but before we do that, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 3. I'm just going to keep playing with this the whole time, if that's okay with everybody. Genesis 3. Actually, we're going to, I think, start at the last verse of chapter 2. Um, so, so far in the story, God has, um, he's created everything. He's, he's put all this stuff together. Um, he's created the man. He's put the man in the garden. He's told him you can eat from any tree you want, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, then God says something that we all know to be true, um, that it's not good for the man to be alone. Um, so God makes the woman, then he steps back, and he looks at everything he's made, and he says it's very good. Now we pick it up in Genesis 2, verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of any fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you again for your word. We ask that, that in it we would find your truth this morning, that you would speak through me, and, um, and that we would encounter you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm doing this. How am I supposed to tell a story just standing here? Okay. Let's, let's, maybe if I hold it like that. Is that better? Yeah. That's better. All right. So the year was 1995. Um, for you history buffs, Gangsta's Paradise by Coolio was Billboard's number one song. Uh, Batman Forever starring Val Kilmer was the year's biggest box office hit. It's just to set the, the mood for you. I was in Mrs. Podlatis' grade five class. Um, a lot of students didn't like her. Um, they made it uh, very well known. Um, but I enjoyed her class. I thought she was a good teacher. I was also a teacher's pet, so maybe that's why. Um, so I'm in grade five, and we're given this assignment. We are to write and to illustrate a story. So... I got to work and and I wrote a a story um, about a girl named Stephanie. So in this story, Stephanie wanted to be different. She wanted to be different from everybody else, and she realized that nobody else in her school 
ever wore a ponytail. So she asked her mom to give her a ponytail. And when she got to school, everybody at school made fun of her and, and called her hair ugly and, and, and I just told her how terrible it was. And, and, and Stephanie, she, she settled down and, and she, she got behind herself and said, you know what, it's my ponytail and I like it. So I don't care what you guys think. The next day, um, Stephanie went to school and everyone at school had a ponytail. Stephanie calls them a bunch of copycats and, and goes home and, and tells her mom, you know what, tomorrow I want a side ponytail. So her mom gives her a side ponytail. She goes to school, same thing happens. Everyone laughs at her. Everyone calls her hair ugly. Um, and, and then they show up at school the following day, everyone with side ponytails. Then Stephanie gets her mom to give her a ponytail right out the top, like she's a pineapple. Same thing happens. She gets her mom to give her a ponytail right out the front and she can't even see where she's going. And the same thing happens. Everyone shows up with a front ponytail. Finally, she's just exasperated and she yells, you guys are just a bunch of copycats. You know what I'm gonna do? Tomorrow, I'm going to come to school bald. The next day, Stephanie shows up at school and every single person in the school is bald except for her, who's wearing a nice, neat little ponytail. That's a pretty good story, eh, for a, for a grade five student. Um, I remember how proud I was um, and, and how proud Mrs. Podlatis was of, uh, of my story, how much she loved it. I remember sitting in my dad's office at Massey Public School and hearing her in the hallway just gushing about how impressed she was by this story that I wrote. I remember her telling the class how, how proud she was of this story that I wrote. I also remember um, the, the sickening feeling in my stomach every time she talked about it um, because I was just terrified that I was going to be found out. You see, a week or so before we were given this assignment, I, I stayed home from school because I was sick. Um, the rule was when we stayed home, there's no fun and games, there's no nonsense. You just lay down and you relax, um, which was a punishment back then, but <laughs> sure would be nice now. Um, so you just, that, that's what you do. You, you have to lay on the couch or in your bed, whatever. Um, so, so that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm laying on the couch. I'm watching one of those kind of low budget morning shows like Deanie Petty or Camilla Scott or whatever they were. Um, and they have a guest on and it's famed children's author, Robert Munch. And he's on the show to promote a new book that he has coming out pretty soon, um, in the next six months or so. Um, and that book was called Stephanie's Ponytail. So I've actually never told this story. I hope my parents aren't mad. <laughs> um, so they have, they have Mr. Munch. Mr. Munch, that's a good character name for, you could be like a, like a lunch guy. Mr. Munch. Okay, lunch supervisor at a school. Anyway, Mr. Munch is, he's sitting on a stool and they have these kids around him. It's a group of kids sitting on the floor and he goes on to tell a story about a girl named Stephanie. And in this story, Stephanie wanted to be different. And she realized that nobody in her school ever wore a ponytail. So she asked her mom to give her a ponytail. And he goes on to tell this funny little story that ends with the entire school shaving their head bald. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that I was terrified to be found out from the moment I handed in this, this plagiarized story until I graduated from grade eight into grade nine. Because I figured once I was in high school, they're not gonna make me go back to grade five. Um, but I was afraid to be found out, afraid that, that everyone would realize that I was a fraud, everyone would see me for who I really was. Everyone would know what I'd done. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like, like you're not the real deal? Like you're a fraud, like you're a fake, like you're going to be found out. Um, maybe you feel like you're, you're one thing publicly and you're another thing privately. Like you're, you're not really authentic. Like nobody really knows the real you. I, I consider myself to be a pretty nice person. Now, it could partially be because I'm codependent and I want people to like me. But, 
I like, I like making people feel good. I like people to get around me and to, to feel better when they get around me, to feel hurt, to feel empowered. <coughs> but sometimes, sometimes I get home and I've been nice to everyone all day long. And now I'm at home and I'm going to be nice to no one. I think some of you might know that feeling. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. Like, like maybe it's your roommate, maybe it's your spouse, maybe your brother or sister or your children. You know, like, I was nice and I was generous all day at work. And now I'm going to be selfish and grumpy. And just that sometimes can make you wonder, like, am I even actually true? Like, who am I? Am I just one person at work and another person at home? Maybe you come home and you, you yell at your dog and you're like, I don't yell at anyone. Why am I yelling at this cute little dog? What kind of person am I? Why am I one person in public and completely different in private? And we hate that we act this way, but we feel like we can't let anybody else in. We can't let anybody know the real us because if they did, there's no way they would love me. There's no way they would want to be associated with me. If you knew what I was really going through, if you knew what I struggle with, if, if you knew what I carry with me, you'd never accept me. Some of us are maybe scared of this in our marriage. If she really knew who I was, she wouldn't love me. If he really knew what I think, what I do, he wouldn't love me. If my friends, if my family really knew who I was, they wouldn't love me. If my boss, my coworkers, if they really knew who I was, they wouldn't accept me. And the, this, this culture that we live in, this cancel culture, which is, it's really just gang shaming, it tells us that this is absolutely true. It tells us that we cannot be fully known and also fully loved. What cancel culture has, has taught us is that if we discover you, we're going to hate you and we're going to bring you down. So I feel shame and I feel condemnation and I feel disapproval. And like Adam and Eve in the garden, I cover up and I hide. And this is where my favorite verse in the entire Bible comes in. Romans 8.1, I think I've used it the last, I think this is the third sermon in a row. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ Jesus, there's no shame for you. There's no disapproval for you. There's no condemnation for you. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm going to show you that this is true. Look back in Genesis 3. We're going to read a little more of the story. So up to this point, Adam and Eve, we find that they were naked and without shame. They eat of the tree that they're not supposed to. They hear God coming, and then they run and hide. So they're now ashamed. They don't want to be found out. So let's go back. We'll look at verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Now listen. God knew where Adam was. God knew where Adam and Eve were hiding. But this is God's character and his heart. For some of us, God's been asking this question our whole life, and you're still hiding. God wants to know, where are you? Why are you hiding? You're like, well, you know, I haven't got my life together enough to, to answer that question, to tell you where I am. Um, just give me some time, maybe fix myself up a little bit. How many times have you heard someone say, man, if I walked into your church... That, that whole place would burst into flames or the walls would cave in or, or some kind of version of that. What is that? That's shame. It's, I'm afraid to encounter God. I think he's mad at me. But God is asking, where are you? Where are you? Some of you, you're hiding. 
You're hiding and, and maybe you've never considered a relationship with God because you're afraid of him. Some of you, maybe you're a Christian and, and you've prayed the prayer. You show up to church every week, um, but you're, you're still hiding. God, I don't really want you to be Lord of my money or my work life or my family or, or the things I do on Friday night. You're hiding. And God calls out to you, where are you? See, we've taken the culture's answer, and the culture's answer is that you can't be fully known and fully loved. I can't let God in all the way. I can't let God fully know me, because then he won't love me. Maybe if he fully knows me, he'll do like, like all those people after Christmas, returning the stuff that they didn't like as much as they thought they would. God will want a refund on his purchase. God won't want me. God won't love me. But like he did with Adam and Eve, God is asking, where are you? Verse 10, Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? See, this is Adam's chance to come clean. This is his chance to be fully known and to say, you know what? Yes, yes, you're right, I did. I ate from the tree, and I'm sorry. But what does he do? He does what most of us do when we're in danger of being found out. He pushes the blame. He blames God, and he blames Eve. He says, that woman that you gave me. So he pushes the blame, and then what does Eve do? Well, it was, it was the snake. It was that snake. See, shame turns to blame. It's not my fault. I didn't have a choice. I had no control. So what's underneath that? Every time you blame, what's underneath it is shame. Every time you say to the people you love most, it's you, or you always, or, or you never, you're hiding. You're hiding yourself. And even after all of this, after all of this, after Adam doesn't come clean, in verse 21, it says that God has compassion on Adam and Eve. And he makes them clothing from animal skin. He trades their fig leaves for sacrifice to cover their shame. How easy would it have been for God to just start over? There's two people. <laughs> that would have been very easy for him to say, you know what? Now, nah, rewind. Let's do this again. But instead, he demonstrates his love. And he demonstrates his compassion. Adam and Eve were fully known and fully loved. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No need to hide. No need to feel shame. When Jesus went to the cross... He took on all of our sin. He died. He rose again. He not only defeated sin and death, but he defeated shame by offering us ultimate forgiveness. See, on the cross, Jesus outed you. On the cross, Jesus outed you. And what I mean by that is, is to accept the forgiveness and the salvation that he offers in his death and resurrection is to point to the cross and to say, that's what I deserve. For the things I do, for the thoughts I have, for the sin I commit in the shadows, that should be me. That's what I deserve. To follow Jesus is to be outed. It's walking into the light and saying, this is who I am. It's to say, I'm not enough. But he is. So I don't have to be. I don't measure up. But he does, so I don't have to. If the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. I want to show you what this looks like practically in one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Um, I've probably preached from it twice this year already. But we're going to go to it again. It's in Luke 15. Some of you might have been already turning there as soon as I said one of my favorite stories. Um, it's a story that, that Jesus tells. 
Um, in, in Luke 15, Jesus kind of does this thing that, that we do as parents um, when we, when we want to get across something that's important. We repeat it. Please go brush your teeth. Did you brush your teeth? Are you sure you brushed your teeth? It doesn't really look like your teeth are brushed. Did you brush them? If, if something is important, we need to repeat it to make sure that the person we're communicating with gets it. Here in Luke 15, Jesus tells three stories that are, that are pretty much the same story in three different metaphors. He tells a story of a lost sheep, a lost coin, and then he tells a longer version of the story. It's like Jesus is saying, this is important. This is important. Hey, this is important. <laughs> God cares about people who are hiding. God cares about people who are lost. God cares about people who are ashamed. God cares about people who have been found out. So Jesus has already talked about the lost sheep. He's already talked about the lost coin. We'll pick up the story in Luke 15, verse 11. And he said, that's Jesus talking. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. Now, if you have read this story or heard this story a few times, this can kind of get lost on us sometimes, how crazy this is. This son is going to his father in this culture that is an honor dishonor culture the this man that he's supposed to be showing honor to and basically saying i just want your stuff just i don't care about you kind of wish you were dead actually so that i could have your stuff right now how how would you react to that because i know what my reaction would be and um you might not be able to put my reaction in a book like this um it might be a little over the top. It, uh, there, there may be some angry words exchanged. Um, but the father reacts in this way. He divided his property between them. The father does it. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, when he came to himself, when he realized, what am I doing? Where, where am I going? Some of us might be there right now. What, what am I even doing right now? When he came to himself. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him. How would you respond? I told you so. You're not my son anymore. Sure, you can come back, but you're going to earn back everything that, that you took from me. While he was still a long way off, the, the, the cool thing about that is that means that the father was watching. That means that the father was waiting. Dad wakes up day after day and says, maybe this is the day my son comes home. Maybe today's the day. While he was still a long way off. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. 
And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let's eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Fully known and fully loved. See, most of us, when we get to the stage of the pig pen, that's where we stay. We made our bed, so we need to lay in it. We made this mess, so I guess it's up to me to clean it up. But as the father did with the son, Jesus is waiting and watching. Like God in the garden, he's calling to you. Where are you? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Some of us, this means maybe coming to Jesus for the first time. It means being outed by the cross as someone who deserves death but receives life. It means accepting the free gift of forgiveness and redemption offered by the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. And you'll get the same reception that the son gets in Jesus' story. Some of us are already Christians, and this means it's time to come clean. To open yourself up to Jesus and to allow him to remove the shame and the condemnation that no longer has to weigh you down. Listen, Jesus doesn't regret saving you. He doesn't want an exchange or a refund. You are fully known and fully loved. There is nothing you can do to make Jesus love you anymore. And there's nothing you can do to make Jesus love you any less. There's a, a Mercy Me song called, Who Am I? And the bridge right before the chorus says this, Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I love that. I am fully known and fully loved, and so are you. Not because of me and you, but because of him. That's what I'm thankful for. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that, that in you, in Christ, there is now, therefore, no condemnation you have you've taken it from us when Jesus went to the cross he he took our sin he took he took death away from us he took our shame he took our condemnation all on himself we thank you for the amazing gift that is trading trading Jesus righteousness for our filthy rags we thank you so much this morning for that. In Jesus' name, amen.